Welcome to Thoughts in the Market. I'm Andrew Sheets, Chief Cross Asset Strategist for Morgan Stanley. And I'm Jens Eisenschmidt, Morgan Stanley's Chief Europe Economist. And on this special episode of Thoughts in the Market, we'll be discussing the recent ECB rate hike and the path ahead. It's Friday, July 22nd at 4 p.m. in London. So Jens, I want to talk to you about the ECB's big rate decision yesterday. But before we do that, I think we should start by laying the scene of the European economy. In a nutshell, how is Europe's economy doing and what do you think are the most salient points for investors to be aware of? Great question, Andrew. We have revised downwards our growth outlook for the euro area economy on the back of the reduced gas flow coming out from Russia into Germany, starting at some point in mid-June. And we are now seeing a mild recession for the euro area economy setting in towards the end of this year and the beginning of next. This is in stark contrast to what the ECB as early as June has been saying your area economy would look like. I think incoming data since our call for a bit more muted economic outlook has been on the negative side. So for instance, we just today had the PMIs in contractionary territory. So the PMIs are the purchasing managers indexes which are soft indicators of economic activity, soft because they are survey evidence, they are essentially questions asked industry participants about what they see on their side. And out of these questions, an index is derived for economic activity. So all in all, the outlook is relatively muted as I said, and I think a recession is clearly in the cards. But Jens, why is growth in Europe so weak? You know, when you think about things like that big decline in PMI that we just saw this week, what's driving that? What do you think is the key thing that maybe other forecasters might be missing in terms of driving this weakness? I mean, Europe is very, very close to one of the largest geopolitical conflicts of our time. We have, as a consequence of that, to deal with very high energy prices. The dependence on Russian gas, for instance, is very high in several parts of Western Europe. But you're right, we have still a commutative monetary policy. So all in all, we still have positive and negative factors, but we think that the negative factors are starting now to have the bigger weight in all this. And we have seen for the first time, as you just mentioned, the PMIs in contractionary territory, while we are, of course, having a bit in the service sector, a different picture, which is still driven from reopening dynamics coming out from COVID. So everybody wants to have a holiday after they didn't have one last year and the year before. So I guess speaking of holidays, it involves a lot of driving, a lot of flying. I think that's a good segue into the energy story in Europe. This has been A really challenging dynamic because you've had, obviously, the risk of energy being cut off into Europe. When you think about modeling scenarios of less energy being available via Russia, how do you go about modeling that and what could the impact be? No, that's really the hard part here. Because ultimately, if the energy is flowing and continues to flow, you can rely on data that goes back and that gives you some relationship between the price and then what you know, the impact on economic activity on that price schedule will be. But if energy is falling to levels where governments have to decide to ration, then the modeling becomes so much harder because you have to decide then in your model who gets gas or oil and at what price. That makes it very hard and it also explains why there's a huge range of model outcomes out there showing a GDP impact for some economies as steep in terms of contraction of 10 to 15 percent. We are not in that camp. We think that even in the situation of a total cutoff of, say, Russian gas, the euro area economy would contract, but not as deeply. Part of that is that we think that some time has elapsed since this threat has first become a possibility. And then what you get is a system that's a little bit more resilient now to a cut than it may have been in March. Jens, I think that's also a good connection to the inflation story. So on one hand, inflation dynamics in Europe look quite similar to the U.S. On the other hand, those inflation dynamics seem somewhat different from the U.S. Core inflation is not as high. Wage inflation is not as high. Could you Kind of walk us through a bit of how you see that inflation story in Europe and how it's similar or different to what we see going on in the U.S. There is 
clearly a difference here. And I think the ECB has never been tiring in stressing that difference that most of the inflation here in Europe is driven by external factors. And here, of course, energy is the big elephant in the room. It's not helped by the fact that we had a depreciation of the euro against the US dollar. And most of the energy is, as we know, built in US dollars. We also have a significant food inflation. And of course, it's also linked very, very tightly to the conflict in Ukraine, where we have Ukraine as a big food exporter. Just think of oil, think of wheat, all these things that are in the headlines. So that's structurally different from a situation in the US where you do have a significant part of the inflation being internal demand driven. And of course, that leads to, in a connection with a very tight labor market, to higher core inflation. Now, core inflation in the euro area has also been picking up, and it's certainly not at levels where the European Central Bank can be happy with. But, you know, all in all, both our set of assumptions and forecasts, as well as the ECBs, in the end, boil down to a slight overshoot in the medium term of their inflation target. So Jens, all of this brings us back to the main event, so to speak. The European Central Bank raised interest rates yesterday for the first time since 2011, and it was a pretty large increase. It was a half a percentage point increase. So what's driving the ECB's thinking here, and how is it trying to weigh all these different factors in a world where rates are rising? So indeed, the ECB yesterday ended its negative rates policy, which was designed for a completely different environment, an environment of a persistent undershoot of its inflation target. By all available measures, they are now at target or above. So that in itself justifies ending this policy, and this is what they did yesterday. Of course, there is a concern that the high inflation that we see today is feeding into wage negotiations, is feeding into a process of more structurally higher inflation, and that risks the anchoring inflation expectations. So there is a need, even if you see the economy going weaker, there is a need to tighten its monetary policy. Now, at the same time, they have this geopolitical conflict just very near to them. They have the risk to growth that we were talking about before. So that also means you cannot just now go out and line out a significant part of rate increases. So that leads to the second component of their decision yesterday. So they were saying, we will go meeting by meeting and we will be data dependent in our move. So Jens, let's bring this back to markets. When you look at what markets are currently expecting from the ECB in terms of rate hikes out over the next, say, 18 months, do you think the ECB is likely to deliver more tightening than those rates imply or deliver rates that are lower than those current market expectations? So if you just talk about where markets see the ECB peaking, that's at 1.5%, we agree, just that we don't agree on the timing. So we, for instance, see the ECB going 50 basis points in September, but then slowing down to 25 in October, another 25 in December. And then we really see the ECB pausing until September next year. And the pause is introduced because the economy is weakening and significantly so. And we see this centered around the end of the year. Now, in the markets, there is a bit of an assumption that the ECB will be more aggressive in terms of getting to the 1.5% earlier. Not necessarily still this year, but at some point early next year. And just from the perspective of markets, you know, this is a reason why Morgan Stanley's foreign exchange team thinks that the euro will continue to weaken against the dollar. It's both a function of yens, your weak growth forecast, but also potentially this idea that rates won't rise in Europe quite as fast as the market is expecting, which would mean somewhat less support for the currency. Jens, thanks for taking the time to talk. Thanks a lot, Andrew. It was a pleasure being with you. As a reminder, if you enjoy Thoughts of the Market, please take a moment to rate and review us on the Apple Podcasts app. It helps more people find the show. The preceding content is informational only and based on information available when created. It is not an offer or solicitation, nor is it tax or legal advice. It does not consider your financial circumstances and objectives and may not be suitable for you.